All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming. Uh, today, I want to talk a bit about performance. Uh, if you attended the keynote, uh, Chet talked about how important performance is and has been and how much work has gone into performance on the platform side for Android. Uh, and performance is also pretty relevant as an app developer uh, sometimes. Uh, and we really need to make sure that we kind of like know how to apply performance patterns in our applications. Uh, so I have uh, a couple ideas about how we might uh, kind of go about making our apps performant. Uh, so these are some best practices that we could try to follow. Uh, the first one that's really important is you just copy random advice from the internet. I think this is very helpful to building performant applications. Um, I, I highly recommend it, especially my advice, because my advice is obviously always correct. Uh, the other thing we can do, um, if you kind of like think about performance, if we've never done performance engineering kind of in a professional work environment, uh, but we have a computer science degree, uh, we learned a whole lot about how to do performance analysis in school. Uh, so this is something that uh, we learned a lot about. We learned about big O complexity, which is this great theoretical framework for analyzing the performance of algorithms in the case where there's literally an infinite number of inputs. Uh, so let's take a look at how we might use this to analyze the performance of an Android application. Well, if I tried to like kind of summarize the performance of an Android application, it probably looks something like this. It's the big O of application plus database plus networking. And if you remember from computer science class, we should rewrite this as a squared p squared l i squared t o n d a cubed t b s e and network doesn't have any repeated letters and then of course in order to fix this in order to make our app performant what we need to do here is think really hard write a proof and turn that 3 into a 2 and that's going to make our app performant Oh, this is not really practical. This is, this is a great theoretical framework for analyzing algorithms, but like, it's not really practical when I have an Android app. I don't really know how to use this in order to actually get things done. Uh, there's also kind of another problem with this theoretical framework when you try to apply it to something like an Android app. Uh, when we actually look at the sort of tasks we do on Android, n, which is like how many things we're putting into that formula, tends to hang out between the number of one to like a thousand. Sometimes it goes way beyond that, but like very often, n is like a hundred. Uh, and these, this theoretical framework really works really well at infinity, but when n's a hundred, uh, things aren't quite as clear cut. Uh, it's not as obvious whether we want to go down in computational complexity. Uh, so we take n equals 100. This is probably a graph. If you have a computer science degree, you probably saw someone on a whiteboard do something like this at some point, where you say, O of 1, I'm going to have 7 operations. O of n, I'm going to have 700 operations. And O of n squared, I have 70,000 operations. So this looks like really, really problematic. It looks like if I have an n squared algorithm anywhere in my Android application, I have a problem. Well, do I? I don't know. Let's turn that into real time. This is how much the user actually has to interact with our application for these algorithms to complete. Uh, so if we look at, I don't know, a microsecond to complete the O of 1 operation, the O of n operation, if I do that same operation 100 times, I'm looking at a tenth of a millisecond. And if I have the n squared algorithm, yes, it's still quite a bit longer than a microsecond, but it's still really, really small in human terms. Uh, so this is maybe not the right theoretical framework to use for performance analysis. Uh, I think 10 milliseconds is fine. Probably don't want to block the main thread for 10 milliseconds, but if I am doing a data fetch and I wait 10 milliseconds to get it for the user, that's fantastic. Let's, let's keep that. Uh, so that said, there are two main uses for computational complexity uh, in your adult life. One, getting a computer science degree. That is super relevant, and you should totally, totally know it for that. And the other really, really, really important adult life use case for computational complexity is Google interviews. And I checked with my boss, I was allowed to say that. So the, uh, the other pattern we might do for uh, performance, and this is one that I kind of fall into this trap a lot, actually, is I go, OK, I know a lot about how computers work. And I have like a pretty good model of like how a CPU works and how RAM works. And I'm just going to sit down, and I'm going to think really, really hard. And I'm going to change my code, because I thought really, really hard. And the end result of thinking really hard is I'm going to get a faster bit of code. And literally every time I've done this since I started at Google, someone who has done more performance work than me has showed up and been like, hey, Sean, by the way, you actually made that slower. Uh, like This has happened every single time. So I would not really recommend uh, thinking really hard unless you have tons and tons of practical hands-on experience with building actual performance, uh, like high-performance things like UI toolkits, for example. 
So these are things that like, maybe aren't going to be helpful for building performant Android applications. Uh, so let's talk about like, what we can actually do. Like, what do we do when we want to actually make our apps performant? Uh, before we get there, like, there's kind of like, I want to talk about like, why we do performance. Because I think both of these are interesting and both of these are valid. Uh, we may be doing performance work. We may be doing performance engineering at work. Uh, and when you do it at work, I call this performance engineering, and it's something I apply like engineering discipline style things to. Uh, you can also do performance for fun, uh, which if you like that sort of thing, is great fun. And when you do that, I call this performance golf. Uh, both of these kind of follow the same kind of overall pattern, though. And that is the core algorithm to how to actually do performance. If, if you take one thing away from this talk, it is this is how you do performance. And then everything else is details. The first thing in order to actually make something performance is I have to have some goal in mind for what performance means. I mean something like this thing runs in this period of time, or this thing uses this many CPU cycles, or this thing is not wasting battery, or this thing is using hardware constraints in this way. I have to have a goal, because if I don't have that goal, and I'm just kind of optimizing without a goal in mind, I can spend literally infinite time cutting random things, and eventually you get to kind of this optimization algorithm where if you make one thing better, the other thing goes up. So you have to have some concrete goal that you're trying to accomplish. Then the other thing that you do once you have a goal is you have to measure. You have to measure the real performance of some code and compare it to the real performance of some other code in order to be doing performance engineering. Then once you have a goal and you have a measurement, then you just kind of like change something. I recommend random genetic algorithms or just monkeys on keyboards, just whatever you want to do. Change something in your code and then go back to 20 and try it again. Like see what happened when you did that change. And this is the core algorithm of performance engineering. And I think the, the key point here really is if you're not measuring, you're not doing performance. You're maybe thinking really hard and having a lot of fun with some abstract theoretical ideas, but if you're not doing measurements, in an Android application when you're trying to do performance, you're, you're doing something else. You're doing a kind of a fun thought exercise. So what is performance in Android? This is just a, a short list of things that came to the top of my mind when I started making this slide. Uh, and it's not super important, but the idea is everything on Android could be performance if you can measure it or you can talk about it in concrete um, real, uh, real terms. Uh, but I'm going to talk about two things that we can measure in this talk and kind of go through how to use some tools in order to actually apply this performance algorithm. I'm going to start by talking about profiling, and then I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the benchmarking library that uh, we're releasing shortly, and it's in alpha, beta. So to get started, I'm going to talk about the CPU profiler. Uh, the CPU profiler, for me, is kind of like the, the magic trick for performance on Android. It's, it's this nice tool that's built into Android Studio. And I would say 80% of the time I've had problems in, re, performance problems in a real world Android application. I've been able to resolve them by using the different parts of the CPU profiler. So I'm going to imagine, actually I don't have to imagine, this is a real bug report that uh, I found in the app that we're going to be looking at. Uh, the startup is slow. The first screen takes too long to display. And this comes in, um, maybe it's filed by my product manager, and the bug report says it seems slow, which is super helpful, sometimes. <laughs> and I'm just not happy about that. I'm just like, there goes my day. I don't know, week, month, I don't know when I'm going to fix this bug. But let's, let's go ahead and take a look at what we can do here. Um, so we've already done the first step. Like, so one of the really important things here, now I have a concrete performance goal. I would like the first show of the first screen to be efficient. So now I can go about, the, uh, go about measuring what's happening in that first screen show and figure out why it's not currently always fast and maybe figure out how to make it fast. Now I need to measure. So I'm going to use the CPU profiler. Uh, in this case, I've gotten a bug report that told me that uh, this, the screen is slow to a level that's perceptible by a human. So it's a really long thing that's taking up all of this time. And given that it's happening during the uh, screen's first show, I kind of suspect it's probably a single function call somewhere that is just taking way too much time. So I'm going to use CPU sampling for this. And we're going to take a look at this bug. Um, just in case my live demos don't work, um, let's go ahead and watch the video of what happens. This is the I.O. Sketch app, which is the, uh, the, de uh, the sample app we make for the I.O. schedule. And if you click this Get Started button in the, uh, 
the first screen. Uh, you can see it happen here. One, two, three, four. Oh, there we go. Uh, so that was like a ridiculously long period of time to wait for the second screen to show up. So something was happening there, and we need to figure out what that is. So let's switch over to the profiler and see what happens. All right, so I have to warn everyone, this is my first time doing live demos. So I'm either going to um, learn how to do it someday other than today, or today is going to work. We're going to find out. <laughs> um, OK. So what I've done is I've uninstalled the application that I'm profiling. Uh, this is something that I think is probably relevant uh, to the fact that that first screen is not showing. Um, I kind of have this like intuition because it's a first screen, and it tends to be more startup the first time I make an application. So in order to get started here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the six run buttons. This one is uh, a half moon with a performance measure on it. Um, and that one means profile. Uh, so we're going to hit the profile button. And that's going to kick off uh, the profiler tool. It's also going to run the application in profiling mode. Doo -doo -doo. And we'll see. Is there a way to make like Gradle faster? Is that, a, is that an option? <laughs> oh, is that the next talk? Great. <laughs> uh, so let's talk a little bit. I don't know. We've got some dead time here. We'll wait for Gradle. Let's talk a little bit about what sampling does. Uh, so what sampling is going to do is it's going to install a timer in your application that's going to fire up uh, very, very, very often, but not continuously, and it's going to check to see what function is happening at the time that that, ti that timer fires, uh, which is really, really useful when I'm trying to capture. In this case, I think I'm looking for a big, long function call. So if I wake up regularly and look for it, cool, retry, enhance. <laughs> the retry button doesn't work. Let's try this again with the other retry button. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so since that's going to happen, if I have a timer waking up every, you know, so often, um, I'm eventually going to get to a situation where uh, the, the timer is going to wake up during this long function call, and I'm going to capture that. Hmm. Android, how does it work? Yeah. Let me just double check to make sure. Yeah. I did do that while I was talking because... I wanted to prep for that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to give this one more go, and then I'm going to load the pre-sampled data, and we'll start digging through that. Uh, but it would be much better. OK, all right, so there goes the live demos. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at the pre-sampled data. It's a little bit less pretty uh, than I get from the live sample, uh, but it will get us to what we want to see. Uh, so uh, let's see. If I, uh, if I had taken a real sample, this top area up here would be instrumented with the activity that was open, and it would also show me when I had actually touched the screen. And what I would end up doing is then like selecting a region between when I touched the screen and when the first activity showed. And I'd try to figure out what exactly is my phone doing in that area. Due to having done this demo a couple times, that area is around right here. So once I do that, I select this region up in the top area, which is showing me kind of the CPU graph, if I had not captured the sample in a fake way. Uh, it's showing me a CPU graph, and I then can select which thread I want to look at. So for example, I can look at this async task right here, which woke up and apparently did nothing. Uh, or I could look at uh, the main thread right here, or render thread might be doing something. Nope. Is anyone actually doing anything? Ooh. Ooh, measurement worker is actually doing some work. Right, so I have all of these threads, but the one that I'm really interested in here, I'm pretty sure, just because, I don't know, that button click sure looked like it was slow, is probably the main thread. So let's go ahead and dive in here. So this happens to be, uh, I have a touch event around right here, and then I have the application showing right here. And I, I can see that. Uh, you can't see that because this is not the live demo I'm supposed to be giving. Uh, then the, uh, when I go in here, I can see that there's, uh, a whole bunch of stuff happening down below. I get this kind of like overwhelming chart of a whole bunch of different functions. So I have this like zygote main init, and then I have a main looper, and then I got some pull once, and then I have these like kind of long tower things. So what this is showing me is in a sampled way, 
every single function that it found, it's, it's representing the call stack going down here. Uh, and this is literally starting from the time that the sample started to the time that it ended. There's no aggregation of these calls happening. This is a re visual representation of the actual calls that are going on here. Uh, so if I zoom in, I have a couple towers here that are taking a bunch of time. And this one right here looks really interesting. So let's zoom in. Um, and I'm just holding command and using my, my scroll options there to do that. Uh, so this one right here uh, says activity on start. And that's a long activity on start. So this is exactly the sort of problem I expect to find when I have a, a screen doesn't show up for a while. So if I dive in here even further, I'm going into a fragment, and then inside here, uh, I'm doing some inflation. OK, so this looks fine. This is my maximum inflation. I expect that to take a reasonable period of time. So I'm going to stop looking at that tower, because that's probably not what's going on there. Uh, then what is interesting is I have this other area over here, which is like wildly longer than maximum inflation. So something, something is, is, is going wrong here, because a fragment on start, like I expect like XML inflation is the bulk of the time. And I dig down through here, and I dig down and dig down, and I go all the way down to the bottom. And what I'm going to start with is that I see on the main thread, I have this function call. Uh, you can barely read this, but you have this function call all the way down to the bottom called load and parse bootstrap data uh, that's taking some hundreds of milliseconds to complete. Uh, and this is all happening on the main thread. It's blocking the appearance of that activity. Uh, so there's. Why is that getting called? There's, I have so many questions. I can actually answer these questions from this chart right here. Uh, so if I go up a little bit, I'm going to find, OK, there's a use case. It looks like this went through some sort of like use case architecture. And then, oh, interesting. Oh, live data on active. So there's some live data somewhere in this architecture that when I observe that live data, is actually making a blocking call to read a file, probably. That's what I'm thinking is going on right here. And this is exactly where I might see a performance problem if I'm going down kind of an architecture like this. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump over to uh, Bootstrap, and let's take a look at this thing. Um, and just confirm that it is, in fact, the thing that I, its name says it is. Uh, so if we look at this load and parse data function, uh, it's using the class loader to grab a file, and it's opening it as a stream, and then it's parsing JSON. So OK, that's not too surprising. And then if I go uh, look at where this gets called, I'm going to find that it's called from uh, get offline conference data. And then if I call this, I'm going to find this is called from a thing called a conference data repository. Right, so I have the architecture here that appears to be attempting to make this thing not happen on the main thread, and it is. It's not happening. Uh, it's happening on the main thread. Uh, so if I look at this, what's going on here? It's just loading some offline data, loading some offline data. And then it's setting it to, ooh, this is interesting. It's setting it to a local ver or a member variable. Oh, and it's a singleton. Ooh, this is interesting. OK, so let's try to figure out what we can do here. So the fundamental problem here is I'm trying to load this data while the user's waiting for that screen to appear. Uh, I could make this thing run in a background thread, but it's still going to take 800 milliseconds, so the user's not going to get the data. But we spent way more than 800 milliseconds on the previous screen. Uh, the user was sitting there in that carousel for probably you know, 10 seconds before they came over to the screen. We had plenty of time to parse this data. So as kind of a quick way to go about solving this, uh, I could go ahead and do that on the other screen. I want to stop uh, before I do that and kind of mention there's another way to solve this uh, if I do want to make this actually happen off the main thread. I can just make this a suspend function. And then I can make a, you know, with context, dispatchers.default, and I can put that in there. Uh, I'm not going to show that in this talk because I then have to rewrite the entire application to use coroutines. Uh, so it's quite a big refactor. Uh, so instead, let's go ahead and look at the uh, kind of quick version, and then we'll fix the, uh, the problem later. So this is actually what I want to do is in this onboarding view model right here, um, I want to go ahead and go ahead and pre-parse that data. Because I only need to parse it once. It gets stored into a cache, which is a singleton. If I've done that, then the next screen will be able to display immediately. Uh, so I can go ahead and do that. And in fact, I actually can do that with uh, coroutines. Uh, view model scope dot launch. And let's, I don't know, put in dispatchers dot default. 
And if you, uh, you know, kind of trace through the code, you're going to see that what this is going to do is it's going to kind of pre-run, uh, it's going to pre-cache that file. Uh, and let's take a run and see if we can actually get a trace of that. Uh, because I'd love to talk about the trace that this causes, so I'd love to, love to have it. But let's wait 10 seconds to see what happens. And while that does, I'll, uh, I'll load up the, uh, the trace for this. Nope, okay. I love that this didn't work and then I fixed it and then I got on stage and it doesn't work again. That's, it's total uh, right there. Uh, okay, so here I go. This. <laughs> All right. So here I have the CPU usage, and somewhere in here uh, I have that parse happening on a coroutine. So let's take a look and see what that looks like. Because uh, I put it on dispatchers.default it should be somewhere on a default thread. And I'm scrolling through, uh, scrolling through, scrolling through, scrolling through. All right, so we have a dispatcher uh, worker one, default dispatcher worker one. Uh, so this is, this is the thread that Kotlin X coroutines has created to run things on dispatchers.default. And kind of interestingly, I see in this, uh, in this trace that I have here, just using dispatchers.default for this single thing has caused three, th threads to be added to my application, uh, and actually quite a bit of, of overhead to happen. Uh, and if I look in here, I can see, okay, like things are actually working exactly the way I expect. Uh, over on this, this default dispatcher thread, it's gonna go ahead and actually call that load and parse bootstrap data. And if I go, uh, if I go into the application, I'll see that now I have that data preloaded when I load that screen, and I get rid of that 800 millisecond delay. Uh, so let's go back to slides and talk a little bit about uh, what we just learned. Uh, so we kind of followed this algorithm. We defined a goal, we measured, we changed something. It was kind of like a hack. It didn't really fit in the architecture. It was a little bit weird. Uh, but it turns out it actually completely solved my performance problem at this moment. Uh, then I can maybe go back and fix the rest of the architecture to make it better. Uh, and then I was actually done. I would met my goal because my, my start time is down in the millisecond range now, so I don't have to continue going. Uh, the kind of key thing that's going on here, this really happens a lot in first load situations. If you can anticipate the user, if you know what the user is going to need four seconds from now, do it now, but don't do it on the main thread, uh, but do it now on a background thread and have it ready for the user four seconds from now. Um, and then they're gonna have a much faster user experience when they get to that thing four seconds later. Especially in this case where we have 800 milliseconds to get that data that they want. Um, and this kind of also showed uh, another pattern that I think is, it's worth talking about. There's a very large architecture in this application. It uses use cases, repositories, data sources. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff built to kind of defend against these blocking calls. Uh, and the problem is there's kind of this little leak somewhere. Uh, I don't know exactly where. I haven't dug into where in the architecture the leak is happening. Uh, but this is pretty common. I've actually seen this in more than a couple applications built this way. Because the core concept here is somewhere at the top of this architecture, there was supposed to be a thread switch. That didn't happen, so then the entire architecture ended up happening on the main thread. Uh, so this is kind of uh, a little bit problematic because now I've just kind of bled my blocking calls all over my main thread, uh, and I have no way at the call site to control that at all. Like way down five levels deep in this architecture, uh, I have absolutely no way to like find this out. I could put like a background thread annotation on it and get a runtime crash, uh, but I can't actually make it correct. Uh, so this is where I think that coroutines actually really shine uh, if I refactor the whole thing. But should I use coroutines to accomplish this very simple task that I've done? I'm, I'm running a single function on a background thread. And I think that really uh, like, kind of comes to the question of like, here I have an application that's built fundamentally using executor services and live data, and I'm adding coroutines, I'm adding a library, I'm adding three new threads uh, just to run a single function. Uh, so why would I use coroutines? They have a better API than callbacks, they offer me main safety because I can use that with context magic, uh, and they give me automatic cancellation. Uh, and why would I use executor services? It's already in the app. Uh, so in this case, I would actually say I would probably not use coroutines to solve this problem. I'm basically just using a coroutine as a big executor service that is adding a lot of overhead to a call a single function. 
So the next bug that we're going to look at is kind of the scroll, slow scroll situation. This one comes up quite a bit in recycler views. And I actually dug into the recycler view on this, and I found so many things that could be improved, which is a common thing when you start digging into performance of big things like recycler views. But I get this bug report, which says the scroll seems slow always. And uh, I'm super happy about this bug report. That's awesome. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at the tracing executor. And we'll just skip trying to run it now and jump straight into load from file. Um, in fact, actually, let's do, uh, sorry. Let's look at the video of this slow scroll so that you can see what we're talking about right here. So once we make it into the first screen right here, I have this recycler view. And if I try to scroll it, I get kind of this like laggy scroll behavior. This is like, I mean, I think we've all made screens that do this. It, it happens. Um, and th this particular one I kind of exacerbated so that we could really see it visually. Uh, but the, the, the general pattern here is, again, I have this like hiccup in my performance during first launch uh, that's going to hurt my engagement numbers. So my, my product manager really wants me to fix it. Uh, so let's go ahead and change the name of this to trace and load it up. Uh, so in this case, this is different uh, than what I had with, I'm going to guess it's in this range, maybe? Uh, this is different than what I had before. Before, I had an expectation that I was going to call a single large function that took about 800 milliseconds. This time, I expect I'm calling a whole lot of tiny functions because I'm in a recycler view scrolling situation. So this time, the call chart is probably going to be less exciting. Uh, it's probably going to be less exciting and less helpful than the flame chart. So the call chart kind of works its way down, and it mirrors the call stack that you're used to, and it follows the exact same time frame. The flame chart is really useful for the situation where I want to aggregate a whole bunch of different uh, like small functions together. Um, I also want to note that I use the tracing profiler for this, which kind of guarantees at huge performance penalty that every single function call is going to get annotated. Uh, so it, your app, when you're using the tracing profiler, will be incredibly slow but you will also find out about every function that gets called in Kotlin or Java. So if I dive in here, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll annotate verbally again. Uh, if I dive in here, I can see I have this dispatch touch event going to the recycler view. And that's the majority of work that's happening in this region that I, I, I captured. And that's because I'm using this flame chart graph. I can answer that question quickly. The flame chart kind of adds up all of the different calls to this function on touch event, and then I can dive through here, and if I go up the flame chart, where is recycle view spending time while it's scrolling? Uh, so it looks like it's trying to bind the view holder for as much time as it's trying to make view holders, uh, and then it's doing some measurement and actually drawing. Uh, so why is it, someone called thread.sleep in the middle of this view holder on bind. Who would add code like that while well, making a performance talk? I don't know. Uh, but let's see what's going on here. Oh. That's, I just jumped to thread that sleep. Uh, so it's in a function called really short function that uh, 100 times or 800 times uh, pauses the thread for one nanosecond, uh, which is just enough to make the recycle view break, but also uh, uh, short enough that it was hard to find with the uh, uh, sampling profiler. Uh, so this is the easiest way to fix a performance problem. All I have to do here is just not call that work, because that wasn't doing anything. That was just making my recycle review slow. Um, and there's like a lot of categories of work that end up happening like that. Uh, so let's go back to the slides and see what's next here. All right. So already, like we, like, we already solved the problem. Like, now we have like, kind of the smooth scroll in a be reasonable behavior. But if I put it on a slower phone and I actually profile this on a real device, I'm still seeing some, some jank in my recycler view. So I want to keep going. I want to go back to step 30, change something again, and measure, and measure, and measure. Uh, so if I dig in a bit more, I'm going to actually find in another trace that there's even more exciting going on here. Uh, it's, it's quite a. Uh, it's quite a deep bug that just kind of keeps giving and giving and giving. And you'll find that if you start optimizing recycler view scrolling, it's always a deep bug that keeps giving and giving and giving. Uh, this, is, this is an area where you can always find more performance, as we will, we will discover. Uh, so let's go ahead and parse this and wait for that. So let's make sure I've got 
no data on the selected thread because I'm not on a thread main. All right. So I've got this dispatch touch event. Okay, so this is looking pretty exciting. So now when I look at this new trace, so I've taken out this thread.sleep call that someone added, uh, and then I'm gonna go ahead and see what's going on here. I have an inflate call, and that's taking the majority of the time. This is, this is great, I'm super happy to see this. That means that things are good, my bind method isn't taking too long. Uh, but then I have this bind method that just visually I, I have a suspicion that something's wrong. This is something like I noticed, this is how I even noticed to talk about this. This tower right here and this tower right here look remarkably identical. In fact, it almost looks like they're the exact same thing. Uh, and that is kind of curious. And this is, this is, this is real production code. Like I didn't, I didn't put this in at all. So let's see what's happening here. So this is finding a full date time. It's doing some string parsing. Uh, it's assigning, oh, it's the binding. So this is the view data binding. And this is happening in response to execute pending bindings. So this makes sense. So I've called execute pending bindings. This recycle review view holder is using data binding. So data binding is going ahead and actually binding all of the properties of this view. And it's all ready to go. Uh, it can go on screen right now. Uh, and it's doing that. And then later on over here, I have another call. This is in the same. Uh, session view holder dot bind call. I have another call to execute pending binding. So data binding is uh, again binding all of the properties for this view and performing the exact same work all over again. Uh, so I have like a thirty percent of my performance in the recycle view is uh, is double binding my views. Uh, so this is actually something that's a little bit interesting. Uh, so I was actually quite surprised to find this in a production application uh, that we had put together. Um, you know, kind of expecting things uh, to work. And why is that? So what happened here? Um, so we, we wrote this bind method. It's using data binding. And we, uh, we, we had to set up the life cycle so that we could use live data here and everything's going to all work out OK. Uh, and then we called execute pending bindings, uh, which was just called by setting the life cycle owner. If you go dig through the code path, which I did while checking to make sure this is a valid edit, uh, it will always call execute pending bindings. So this is always duplicate work. Uh, so just doing this one line of code right here gives me another 30% speed up. Um, if I dig in the rest of the way, um, I think this trace is also fairly instructive about like where I can go from here. Um, so I'm doing, uh, uh, I'm not going to do these here, but if I look at what's happening here, I'm doing a lot of allocation of drawables, and I'm doing a lot of allocation of uh, opacity and, and setting things up in this layout inflation pass. Uh, so this is probably the next area to optimize. So let's go back to the slides and take a look at what we learned. Uh, so the first thing here is uh, I happen to be involved in writing this app, and I know how that line of code got written. Don't apply random performance advice you found on the internet. Uh, that came from a Stack Overflow answer that some Googler read, and it said, always call execute pending bindings in your, uh, your data binding view holder, or you will do a double layout pass in your recycler view, and then your recycler view will be slow. So we added that line of code to make our recycler view faster, but it was 30% of the work the recycler view was doing. Uh, and it was also totally redundant. So this is like, don't, don't, don't apply random performance advice from the internet. Profile when you're doing performance. It's very, very important. Uh, and then the, like, this is really like the key. If you don't need it, remove it. This is like 90% of the time when I go digging through a production app to fix performance problems, I'm just deleting code. Or I'm like moving it around and like shuffling it around so that I'm not dealing with it right away. Uh, but that's not going to solve like everything here. Uh, so we go through that. Uh, I still have like a lot of problems here. This thing doesn't scroll very well on a slow device. If I fling, I can easily get 140 millisecond. Uh, frame durations. Uh, so there's like there's some real performance problems here, and if I really want this to be like incredibly smooth on a really slow device, uh, I'm not going to be able to solve that by deleting code, and I'm not going to be able to solve that by like following like performance advice from the internet. I'm going to have to start doing clever things. Uh, so next, I'm going to have to start thinking really hard and trying things, and then measuring, and then trying things and measuring. Uh, some of the like obvious optimizations, looking at the, the uh, flame chart that we have, uh, we can cache those drawables. We're drawing the same drawables on the screen in every recycler review view holder, uh, but we're spending a fantastic amount of time inflating the drawables. Uh, so we can actually go ahead and deal with that. Uh, we're spending almost all of our time processing dates, which is like super typical. That's very normal. Uh, when I'm assigning a date to a text view, I'm doing two very expensive things put together. Uh, so I can go ahead and uh, 
look at ways to make that date processing not block the main thread's draw loop. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ideas I have here. Half of them are probably going to make the app slower. I need to measure all of those to find out whether they're the right thing to do. Um, I can start pulling out some of that text drawing. There's a lot of text on that screen. Uh, so if I'm really trying to make this thing performant, I'm going to start taking a look at what happens if I'm not actually drawing text in those areas. And then the last thing, if you really dig into this trace, you're going to find out that constraint layout plus recycle view is a couple times doing a double layout pass because of something about someone setting up somewhere in some XML file. Uh, so I can either fix that, and maybe that's going to make the problem go away, or uh, if I really, really, really care about this and this thing is worth like, a lot of money, uh, I might just make a custom layout. This layout's not that hard. I could just measure it myself. Uh, so there's like a lot of options, and I think the key here is uh, follow this algorithm. Measure all of these things. All of these are probably bad ideas, and half of them make your app slower. Uh, but the other thing is fully optimized code is often very bad code. Uh, I'm, I would be super unhappy to find any of those optimizations I just mentioned applied to a screen that a user never looks at. Uh, all of those is gonna, are going to make your code really, really, really messy uh, and create like all sorts of weird indirections or extra caching layers that, if they're not needed, uh, really just complicate things for absolutely no reason. Uh, so the last thing we're going to look at is SysTrace, and I'm just going to demo the UI. Uh, this is going in even further, and still in this recycle view. I still have performance to pull out here, and I want to find out what it's doing. So let's take a look at the SysTrace trace of that, and it's useful to kind of discover what SysTrace offers that the other options don't. Uh, so SysTrace is the third CPU performance or CPU profiling option. It's uh, trace system calls, uh, and it's very different than the other ones. I will just jump straight to the after JIT. Um, do, do, do. Okay. Uh, this will be a hard one to do. What? Okay. Um, this will be a hard one to do. Oh, here we go. Oh, look. Okay. So SysTrace gives me this beautiful uh, profile here. So what I've done in this application run right here is I've opened up the APK and I immediately flung the recycler view, which is like the worst possible thing you can do to recycler view and constraint layout. Uh, and then I waited for that to settle down, and then I uh, pulled it back up to the top and flung it again, and that's the one we're going to look at. Um, and the reason for this, um, we can actually kind of answer the question, uh, if this is a full trace, we'd be able to see which CPU core was actually doing work. Uh, that's an important thing about SysTrace. This is fantastic when you're debugging things like, what are coroutines doing with the default dispatcher? Why is it starving the main thread? Um, but the other thing that's going on here is we have this JIT thread pool, uh, which in the trace that we're looking at right here doesn't have that much working on. But during this part right here uh, at the beginning, uh, constraint layout and recycle view are both going to, through JIT cycles while they're trying to perform a ridiculously complex animation at the same time. Um, so I'm going to discount that case because that's not the normal case. People don't normally install a new application and immediately fling a recycle view full of complex cards. Uh, that's a little bit complicated. Uh, but I do want to like zoom in on what happens in this second fling here. So if I go into main, I can see like one of the really, really cool things that SysTrace gives me that allows me to really like use a tool like this to great advantage. So what I'm seeing here is the main thread and the render thread. And all of these little red boxes are frames that I missed. Uh, and this is on uh, Pixel 3 something. This is on a pretty reasonable phone. Uh, and so if I run this exact same code on a slower phone, uh, uh, I'm going to have problems. Uh, if this was the slower phone and I was missing frames by deadlines like this, I'd probably be OK. Like, this is fine. Uh, but the th uh, realistically, I'm going to expect this is going to be quite a bit slower on a slower phone. Um, and if I look at what's happening in these regions, we can see kind of that SysTrace gives us a completely different view than what we had in the other traces. So the other traces were all about Java functions. Uh, SysTrace is all about. Uh, literally SysTrace annotations. Like there's calls to a thing that says trace in the Android code base. So anytime you call into the platform code base or you add your own SysTrace tags, uh, it's going to trace what thing is happening. Uh, so right here we can see that the uh, traversal are happening, and this will probably be more useful as a, a flame chart, so let's flip that over because I can see it's multiple frames. Uh, so I, if I look at this as a flame chart, I can see that recycler view on layout is taking a lot of time and recycler view scroll animations are taking a lot of time. Uh, so now I'm 
again, like I'm getting back to this idea, if I really need to pull more performance out of this, if I still haven't met my goal, uh, that it's time to start using, uh, time to start looking at that layout pass and see what's going on there and how we can make that better. Do, do, do? Yeah, yeah, I know. What time is it? Oh, okay. Let's jump to benchmarking, Woohoo! All right, so let's jump to benchmarking. I'm not gonna talk about the memory profile unless we have time at the end. Uh, so benchmarking is really a, a useful tool. So we talked about profiling, which is like trying to measure real app performance. So it's like actually running my application with real data, maybe actual network requests, seeing what happens, seeing what methods are called. Benchmarking is none of that. I'm not using real data. I'm not running my real application. I'm calling some totally uh, fictitious code that uh, demonstrates a problem, hopefully, uh, or demonstrates a, a use case that I'd like to support. And then I'm getting a totally uh, fake number out of it, actually, a number that is unrelated to how long this code takes to run in, in production. Uh, so benchmarking is all about measuring performance repeatably and reliably. I want it to run the same benchmark on the same piece of code on the same device and get the same fake number out every time. And if I change the code such that it would run faster in production, I want a faster fake number out for my benchmark. Uh, and I keep saying fake number because it's really important that the benchmark library that we're putting together uh, does not give you anything related to how long the code takes to run on a physical real device that's running at full clock speed. Um, so it's a library that we're, it's currently, uh, it's currently in beta, uh, and it's going to be hopefully coming out uh, to stable soon. Uh, but it's a, it's a relatively deep library. Uh, it's, you might think like to run a benchmark of a piece of code, all I have to do is call it 10,000 times and measure how long that takes. Uh, but it turns out uh, if you do that, um, most likely your phone's going to overheat, and then the next thing that happens is the CPU will get slowed down. Uh, so then halfway through your benchmark, your CPU runs at a slower clock speed than it did at the beginning of the benchmark. Uh, so it does all sorts of statistical tricks to try to determine that. It uses like literally every knob in the Android kernel to make that not happen. Uh, it will do things that are really clever, like try to make it so that you uh, lock the screen uh, so that it has the same sustained performance mode if that's available on the Android platform that you're on. Uh, if you're on a a device, it's going to go ahead and just even lock the, the clocks. Specifically, it has the ability to do that so that the thermal throttling never even happens. Uh, so to use it, you have to use a separate test runner because it does all sorts of crazy nonsense like I just said, and it really goes quite deep in how that works. And it's really about how to figure out continuous performance, how I can take a, a piece of code and make sure that it's fast today, and then as my app changes over time, it stays fast over time. Uh, so I, to do that, I want reliable, controlled, and repeatable. These are like the three key concepts I want for performance benchmarking. And then when I have these numbers, I can then define the goal measure and change something. Uh, there's a couple things you need to know about benchmarking. It's in a, you'll have to put the code to benchmark in a separate module. Uh, this does put some weird constraints on, uh, on how things actually end up fitting together. Uh, but you have to do that for uh, reasons related to how the code gets built uh, in order to make the benchmark happen. Uh, you can't profile code, the code that's under benchmark directly without making a non-benchmark version of the invocation. Uh, and you should really try to use a rooted device. You're just going to get the best behavior out of a rooted device. Uh, and the other thing to really know is if you're doing benchmarking, you probably want regressions, and the library does not do regressions. So what I want to really talk about is now I have these fake numbers, what do I do with them? Or more pointedly, what does Google do with them? Uh, so here's what we actually do. Um, so we, we use this library to instrument the UI toolkit. Uh, and we get numbers that hopefully look like this. This is the dream case right here. Uh, so what we do is we keep track of the last 20 builds of this thing, and we run the benchmarks over that. And then we run a statistical analysis looking for that. Like this is exactly the thing that we consider a success. And I don't have speaker notes. Uh, the statistical algorithm is called k-means something. Uh, it's not super important. There's, a, there's blog posts about how to do detections like this with statistics. But what it's really trying to do, k means clustering. What it's really trying to do is find uh, two clusters that have a statistical difference from each other. And then from there, we go ahead and hand tune a bunch of knobs to decide whether this is actually uh, interesting or not. Uh, and that's literally, like, there's no like, magical statistics at all in our infrastructure. We literally just hand tune knobs until we get what we consider good benchmark results. Uh, and this is great because like that was uh, you know, this is a performance improvement and this is a performance regression, right? These are both very visual. Uh, 
This here is also, we have some benchmarks that look like this. This is also another piece of data you're gonna get out of your benchmark. This probably is touching the file system or something nonsensical like that that has like ridiculous amounts of randomness in its timing. Uh, but we can't derive any value from this data. There's no way we're gonna figure out whether there's a regression or not because the data is just too noisy to be useful. Uh, and then the other thing that I, I really wanna talk about in the benchmark, and this is true about like all performance, when you present about performance to like your PM or your other engineers, uh, don't show graphs like this. Uh, so uh, there's a problem with this graph. Uh, it, it's going down and to the right. Uh, and this is like just a, a pretty, pretty deep problem with this graph. And I, have, I, I really wanted to share this as my number one pro tip for performance. Uh, you want to go up and to the right. On every graph you show ever, uh, sometimes they're really, yeah, anyway, uh, every graph you show ever should go up and to the right. So all you have to do is just change that into percent speed up. So we just take the, we find some number, and we're gonna say that's the baseline, and we just provide the, use the regular percentage formula, and then ta-da, it goes up and to the right. Uh, so just a little bit of math takes my depressing down into the right graph and turns it into up in the right graph. I strongly recommend whenever you present performance numbers to people, always talk about percent speed up because the graphs go up and to the right. Okay, so enough slide tips. Let's talk about some code here. How am I actually gonna write this benchmark? Uh, so I have a test. Oh, five minutes over. All right, and then we're gonna call measure repeated. Uh, and that's the entire benchmarking API. And then I'm gonna launch some coroutines, which are gonna launch some coroutines, which are gonna launch some coroutines. Uh, and then at the end, I'm gonna get to this lovely slide here, which says we have coroutines versus executor service, which I've, I benchmarked both. Which one won? If I'm answering the question, should I use this in my application? And the answer is, I'm not gonna put that on a slide. Uh, but uh, suffice to say, they came in, uh, they came in relatively uh, similar to each other when I wrote similar code, uh, but I don't wanna put this on Twitter, so I didn't put any numbers on a slide here. Uh, and then I have a lovely compose story, catch me at lunch. Uh, then that's it, performance in a Kotlin world. I don't wanna keep you from lunch anymore. <laughs>